previously on Knitting Time with Willie. I'm not entirely sure why I did that. Hello everyone and welcome and all that jazz. I, sh I should probably figure out an intro line for this show, but I think that's that's probably a problem for next episode. Anyway, my name is Willie, joined as always by my co-host Nicholas. And this is Knitting Time with Willie, where today I'm going to continue with part three of my deep dive into America's Next Top Model, Cycle 6, because, um, well, I just did part two, and, and that's how counting works. Since starting this series, I've honestly been surprised by how much I managed to learn by watching Top Model with a more critical lens, and though it may look like I'm having a slow, prolonged, poorly edited mental breakdown, I really feel like I've grown a lot in the past few weeks from making this show. With that in mind, I'm actually uncharacteristically excited to see what's next, so rather than prattling on, I'm just going to get started and see what other new lessons this show has for me that I can apply to my everyday life. Like I said last week, Tyra will usually say the theme of the episode outright at the beginning of judging, so let's jump ahead and See what this week is all about, shall we? This week you learned about how to pose for a cover of a magazine. That is very specific. They're, they're usually a lot broader than that. I am not sure how I'm going to apply that to myself. Shit. But, uh, okay, let's talk about the episode anyway, and, and, and maybe we'll get somewhere. Or, or not. I, I don't know, but in any case, this is Cycle 6, Episode 2, The Girl Who Is a True Miss Diva. Before we go on, just a little editor's note. I know I said Episode 2, even though this is the third episode. I made a mistake last week because the first and second episode were actually grouped together, so they share the same production code. Uh, I just want to say that I deeply apologize to all of you for the mistake, and, and most importantly, I apologize to Tyra. Anywho, uh, this episode opens with Jade, so you can tell that it's going to be a good one because the first person that they highlight on these shows is, is usually the one that they focus on the most during the course of this episode, and if you've watched this show, you know that I love me some Jade, especially because in this episode... She is here to fight. Jade is angry because she got called arrogant in the judging panel last week, so so naturally she's dealing with that anger by talking about how weak Gina is behind her back for some reason. Gina has a lot of problems, dude, like personal problems with herself. It shows. You're in a competition. Yeah. You can't be weak-minded. As you can see, Feranda is wearing a puffy pink princess tiara for some reason because I love her, and, and Sarah is also there. The show is really ramping up tensions between Gina and Jade, and though it does eventually pay off, as of now it's basically just them talking about each other behind each other's backs, and honestly it shouldn't feel as tense as it does, except for the fact that the scoring to the show is... Well, I'll say it, it's absolutely masterful. Nobody's gonna want a, a weak America's Next Top Model. I'm at the bottom of the barrel. You need to know that right now you're at the bottom of this heap. But I'm not scared of Jade, because if she comes over there with silliness, then I'm going to deal with it. As life has repeatedly reminded me, I do not know how Hollywood works, but that said, I genuinely do hope that whoever is in charge of cello on this show won an Oscar, because, well, I think it's safe to say that they are one of the great musical geniuses of our time. After Jade's extremely entertaining bitch sesh, all of the girls pile in to a bunch of cars and it's on their ride that Gina decides to talk to Wendy about how she always seems checked out and and Wendy tries to play it off like she's just a little distracted. Sometimes I'll like look around you and like zoned out. Probably I'm thinking about something. I'm like I always think about something. Right now I think it's kind of hard. I'm slowly getting over everything from New Orleans. I didn't know where my parents were. They were trying to evacuate and they just slept in a car for like two days and that was the last time I talked to them. And like I get that Gina is young and, and maybe not the most emotionally mature person at this time, but like, come on, you, you probably should have been able to guess 
why Wendy is distracted right now. I don't know the timeline of this show, and I refuse to ever do research into it, but the fact that Wendy just figured out where her parents are means that this stuff is insanely fresh, and honestly, the fact that she's even walking at this point is incredible to me. I spent full days in bed recovering from the stress of, of having cracked my phone, so the fact that Wendy is able to compete is incredibly impressive and probably means that under normal circumstances, she would be an amazing competitor. Instead, she goes home this episode. It's kind of obvious from the get-go that Wendy's time is almost up because whenever someone goes home on this show, they usually have a little section at the beginning to kind of explain why. And between Gina and, and this little talking head that they cut to... Wendy definitely seems distracted off in her own little world. She has a lot of things occupying her mind. It really feels like the show is trying to, like, incept us into thinking that Wendy goes home because her head is somewhere else other than the competition, which, like, I guess that's true? But the way they go about it really does make it feel like they're trying to place a lot more blame on to her than I think she deserves as a Katrina survivor. Very recent one. Even in that clip I just showed you, the fact that they cut from a talking head to a voiceover mid-sentence feels like they probably cut out part of what Carrie said, and if I had to guess, I'd bet Carrie said something along the lines of Wendy seems distracted because of Katrina, but they cut out the Katrina part to make it seem like Wendy has more agency in her distractedness than she actually does, so when she inevitably gets eliminated for no reason, we as the viewers are, are less angry about it. This is, of course, all speculation on my part, but that said, it would not be out of the realm of possibility for how these shows work. When they're done establishing what a lame space cadet uh, Wendy the Katrina survivor is, they get out of their cars and arrive at a salon because today they will be getting real makeovers instead of those lame fake ones that they got last week. You girls are going bald. You can tell that it's official this time because Tyra is there instead of whoever the fuck Eve was, and Tyra doesn't show up for any lame-ass pranks. When Tyra pranks you, it's, it's amazing. You'll see. Tyra is there to tell the girls what makeover she chose for them, but first she takes a moment to introduce the stylists. I'm going to introduce the masters. First is Joel Warren. Joel is the master of color. And Edward Tricomi is the master of the cut. And I only show you that clip because I love how she talks about them, like they're like these ancient omnipotent beings that she had to summon via some sort of like ritualistic sacrifice because they literally never come up again. I honestly don't even think that they actually do any of the girls' hair. I think that they're just kind of there to like give their stamp of approval and, and then leave. Most of their makeovers are very subtle, but it's fun how they present them because they do these before and after photo shoots to make it seem like they've undergone this huge transformation, but I think that the only reason that they actually look better in the after is that the after photo shoots are done on like a professional sound stage with lighting and everything, while the before photo appears to have been taken at the DMV. Sarah absolutely hates her makeover and it's like the clearest glimpse we get into the absolute disdain she feels for being on this show. Sarah, we didn't know how much face you had, girl, until we saw that bald photo shoot. It's gonna be short on the sides and longer on the top. And it's going to be Bridget Nielsen Platinum Blonde, all right? I am immediately shocked because it's nothing like my personal style. Here, she feels very much to me like that one person in drama class where everyone is supposed to do a silly exercise and like she does the exercise, but she just keeps talking about how silly she looks and how embarrassing it is. And it's like, one, you don't look that silly. Two, we're all doing it. And Three, the only thing you should be embarrassed about is the fact that you keep talking about how embarrassed you are. For those wondering, that's me. I'm describing myself. I was very bad at drama class. There's a reason I've limited my performing to reading a script alone in my living room. My favorite part of watching Sarah's makeover is that she's clearly very aware of the cameras, so she just kind of sits there quietly in a way that's both like low-key, but also makes her look like she's completely broken inside. 
Sarah gets this crazy, funky haircut that just didn't really fit her personality, and she really took it not good. It seems like you can do a lot with that, though. A lot. Which is good. I think I mentioned this before when I was bashing Sarah for no reason, but this is where we learn that she has like some sort of ties to politics, and that makes a lot of sense and kind of explains her a little more. My wife hasn't worked for a conservative senator. I guess I'm not going to the Christmas party this year. Why? <laughs> and like, look, I can understand getting upset by a bad haircut, but it's just funny to me that Sarah thinks that she's getting some ridiculous makeover because it doesn't even really look that different to me. Maybe it was different in 2006, but like, honestly, I don't even think that a conservative senator would bat an eye at that today. The other person who gets really upset by her makeover is Jade because like, of course she is. That's why I love her. Of all the girls, she's the most excited for the makeovers and she very much has her heart set on getting extensions. I need long hair because I know in the industry, long hair is what sells. Of course, Tyra soon dashes those hopes in in the worst way possible. Last but not least, Jade. We want to make you look softer, sweeter, elf-like. This short, blondish with blondish eyebrows. <laughs> I was really shocked about that. In true Jade fashion, she spends a lot of time complaining about the look and like clearly hates it. And like, I know better than to ever give my opinion on a woman of color's hair. So all I'll say is that I don't think that Jade is wrong to be upset by it. And honestly, it's really annoying too because Jade's original hairstyle was gorgeous and it goes with her personal style really well in a way that like was kind of the goal of these makeovers to begin with. During the makeovers, the Jays walk around and ask the girls to sum up their own personal style in a few words. I want you to define for us what you think your personal style is. I like vintage a lot. So you're late 40s, early 50s vintage girl. And when they get to Jade, Jade says that her style is bohemian, which the Jays don't seem to agree with at all. I think you're like that fashionista girl. Not really. I'm okay, what's your bohemian. More you think you're a bohemian girl? Yeah, sounds so like early. But ultimately that is the style that they go with and her original hair would have projected that look really, really well. And of course, that is not to say that having an Afro equates to being bohemian in the real world because it does not, but like in the very simplified myopic view of the fashion industry circa 2006, it kinda did. Like even Tyra mentioned that Jade had bohemian vibes when she first met her in casting. She's so like nature girl, Afro, like Afrocentric beads. You think she would be like, my sister, we are all beautiful. But she's like, screw this, I'm fine. My guess is that the show didn't want to cast Jade as a bohemian because she doesn't have like a super flower power personality, uh, which is also the only reason that could explain why Miss Jade brings up the Black Panthers for, for, for seemingly no reason. More you think you're a bohemian girl? Yeah, sounds so like party. Yeah. The show very clearly wants to portray Jade as the fighter of the season, while Jade sees herself as more of a hippie. And the truth is, she's probably both, because Jade is a very complex person. Uh, but whatever the case may be, though, she's absolutely more bohemian than Carrie, who gets to pick her personal style with absolutely no objections. I really like the 60s. I think they kind of went with the okay, 60s. Okay, so like bohemian yeah. chic. And Let's be honest, I've already delved deeper into this topic than I should as a white man, but before I move on, I just want to add that I don't think that anyone really thought that Jade's new hairstyle was going to look good on her. Like, when I said earlier that of course Jade gets upset, I was not blaming Jade. Maybe they didn't think it would be actively bad, but at the very least, I think that the production team was like, Let's take a big swing with Jade. We want to make you look softer, sweeter, elf-like. Because like I said last week, they want a gifable moment out of someone freaking out over their makeover, and she has proven herself to be the most dramatic contestant, so they probably felt like she was their best bet at getting one of those. Don't even try to test me. Don't want to test me, no. 
And for what it's worth, just like last week, she doesn't even complain that much. Like, I feel like it looks a lot worse than it actually is because they keep cutting to a bunch of contestants who keep telling Jade to shut up in Talking Heads. I don't know why they're leaving my top longer than my side. Jade, just shut up. Antonio was like, we're gonna cut this short and leave this high. Oh great, another like mohawk look. Oh my gosh, shut up. <laughs> I'm going to move on, but before I do, I just want to make sure that I say that, dramatic or not, I do think that it's very clear that Jade gets screwed in a lot of ways that my ignorant racist ass did not pick up on in, in 2006. Like I said though, Jade is complex, so she can very easily transition from the victim to the villain in the span of just a few seconds, and of course she does just that, because the only good thing that comes from the makeover is the fact that Jade gets mad at Feranda because Feranda got the makeover that she wanted and well let's just be honest it's always fun when Jade finds someone new to hate. Feranda is so feeling this hair right now when there's a mirror anywhere she's in it fixing that hair. Jade then says this that is a true Miss Diva which gives us the title of the episode and the editors then use that as a way to transition to a beautiful scene in which Feranda is seemingly acting like a real Miss Diva. This is part two of my conspiracy theory that Feranda was set up by the producers to look crazier than she actually is, although re-watching this scene, I, I may have to take back everything that I said. What she does here would be very hard for the producers to fake, so now I'm thinking that maybe Feranda does maybe have like just, just a couple of, of screws loose, although... That's dead, I, I still want her to be my friend. Basically what happens is that she decides to hand out a bunch of rules that she expects everyone in the house to follow, and in case you're wondering, yes, she is wearing a fluffy pink princess tiara as she does it. I know what I'm, I'm gonna do right now. Chill though. I'm about to hand out my rules. I had a list of tips, just common courtesies that I would expect for the girls. In her defense though, they are good rules. These are tips. Rhonda's tips for security. Welcome. Well, that's hilarious. <laughs> if you've ever lived with roommates, particularly at this age, it actually does make sense to make sure everyone is on the same page with regards to common courtesy, because you will get into confrontations down the line if everyone is not. Uh, but that said, Wearing a tiara during that conversation really does change the optics of the situation. I think in her mind she was trying to prevent confrontation by letting everyone know her ground rules early on, but unfortunately in the world of Top Model the only way to avoid confrontation is to sit perfectly still at all times and then get eliminated early and, and even then it's still kind of hard. Still, with that in mind, I take back what I said about the producers entirely setting Feranda up to look crazy because I don't know how they would have been able to trick her into doing this. Uh, I think Feranda was just a quirky person who quirked her way into a situation that was easy for them to edit into something that seems a lot bigger than it actually was. Well, why are you doing this? Because I wanted, this is, these are things I wanted everyone to know. It's your copy, if you wanna throw it away, you can throw it away, but I gave it to you. And at the very least, I do think that the producers facilitated the incident because I don't know how she would have had access to a printer otherwise. Someone had a driver to Kinko's. I'm telling you, that hair has made her confidence level through the roof. She thinks she is like an imitation Naomi Campbell, but she's got it all twisted. After the incident, Veranda and Jade have a nice little conversation in their bathroom, which is like a masterclass in passive aggression. How's she gonna rock your curl? You can wear it if you want. I wouldn't be caught dead wearing that, sweetheart. Okay. Like, honestly, I don't know if Jade is trying to subtly insult Feranda or just can't repress her disdain well enough to hide it, and this is what slips out. But whatever the case is, this line is absolutely masterful. And you know, that's something people have always hated about me, the fact that they can't really get under my skin. Hate is like such a harsh word. I can see disliking, but hate is... Ooh. And again, all this disdain that... Jade seems to have for Veranda happened specifically because Veranda was given a makeover that Jade wanted that Veranda didn't choose and 
and had absolutely no control over and well I guess what I'm saying is this is why Jade is one of the greats. We then cut to Sarah on the phone with her boyfriend talking about her haircut and I think this is the first time on the show that she's ever expressed a human emotion and also possibly the last time that she ever expresses a human emotion. It's yeah. ridiculous. Like, you don't like it? No. It's just not me. I was not gonna be the girl in the salon crying about her new makeover. I enjoy this moment because I am very much a petty bitch and you know that Sarah had watched this show before she went on and was like, I will never be that girl who cries over something as silly as a makeover. But you know what, Sarah? You did. You did. Up next, they go and watch some random ass fashion show for the first part of their mini challenge. Wendy is of course off in the clouds again, probably daydreaming about whether her parents slept with a roof over their head last night instead of, instead of what actually matters, which is this fake fashion show sponsored by Chic Lady Razors. I'm gonna drift it away from the fashion show for a minute. It's kind of hard with everything going on back in New Orleans. A little side note about the fashion show. Um, as I was watching, I saw one of the models on the runway and I was like, hold up. And then I looked it up to confirm that it is in fact Celicia who would go on to win cycle nine of the show. Uh, this has very little bearing on the rest of the episode, but I do call bullshit on the entire rest of the series because of it. After the Lady Razor fashion show, they get to go backstage and pick out an outfit from the clothing that they saw on the runway, which they're supposed to use to express the personal style that they picked out with the Jays during their makeover. And well, a lot of fun ensues. Like I said earlier, they literally had to sum up their entire personalities in a couple of words and the span of a two minute consultation with the Jays. And now a lot of them are dealing with the fact that summing yourself up that succinctly that quickly is is not an easy thing to get right. Like the process of picking out their personal styles was such a blur to them that Sarah somehow ended up branding herself as street chic, which like, I'm not entirely sure how that happens. Who is Sarah now? There's a lot edgier than she used to be. Like street chic? I have to redo my whole wardrobe. Okay, I'm street chic. Oh, that's street chic right here. I kind of was unsure of what my style really was. You can tell that Street Chic was probably not the right choice for Sarah because she just ends up on a quest for hot pants for some reason. Even though I don't think anyone has called them that since the 1960s. So maybe it's like wear my bra and like hot pants underneath. These like hot pants. Do you, like, you don't have hot pants obviously. When they've chosen their looks, they go to some random studio loft looking place where they meet celebrity stylist Rachel Zoe, who is going to be the one judging them on their looks. And this is honestly one of my favorite moments in the episode because Rachel Zoe is actually a pretty big get for the show, but they have Jade introduce her and Jade clearly has no idea who Rachel Zoe is, but she really tries to pass it off like she does. The Miss Fabulous Rachel. She is the stylist of the stars. She, she's big. They give the girls 15 minutes to do their hair and makeup to complete the look. And like most things on this show, it just turns into one big CoverGirl cosmetics commercial in a way that's like so blatant it almost swings back around to being charming again. We have here today the Queen Collection, a brand new line of makeup designed by Queen Latifah and CoverGirl for women of color. That's awesome because it's hard for me to match my skin tone. I have like yellow tints, I have red tints. This is the Queen Collection. Thank you. Cheeks are lighter than down right. here. But that gives amazing contour by the way. I really like my makeup. It's a fresh look, it's not too heavy. Nana wins and I think it's because she's the only person on stage who who dressed like a human. Thankfully, we also get a good glimpse at what Sarah thinks street chic means and like, like I don't know how to dress, but, but I think that like even I would have done better in this challenge. But hey, at least she ended up finding those hot pants she was looking for. For the record, I wouldn't leave the house in these. Like I would never do that. The girls head back home and were treated to one of the all time classic fights in the history of America's Next Top Model. So like, buckle in because, because this is a lot. I've been worrying a little bit that I've built Jade up so much as a character that she wouldn't live up to the hype. But um, after rewatching this fight, I'm not worried about that anymore because 
Jade picks a fight with another girl for talking on the phone for too long. And that girl is known Katrina survivor Wendy. Fighting over the phone is a time-honored tradition in the annals of Top Model. Like, the show only provides the girls with one single phone in the house. And I think that's because the phone is like the only outlet they have from the competition. And so they want them to fight over the opportunity to use it. And, and when I say I think there, I mean, that's definitely why there, there's, there's no other reason why that would be. But even though phone fights happen every season, never before has there been one that is like this clear cut. Like on one hand, you have Wendy. Everyone's really like displaced from the hurricane. I have like family all over the place. We had like eight and a half feet of water in the house and, and we couldn't even get in the kitchen. And then on the other hand, you have Jade. Yeah, excuse me, yo, I need to use the phone. I have not used the phone like since I got my haircut. May I please use I'm the phone? I'm fine, I had to well, give get me up at three o'clock in the morning. When I get off, Yo, I'll let you know. That's foul. I hadn't talked to my family since my makeover, so everything was building up inside of me. Jade does not care about Wendy's situation at all. She just wants to talk to her mom, and since she can't do that, she just kind of ends up going into a tailspin. I haven't used the phone at all, but everybody else has used the phone. I don't know who I am right now. I'm lost. I need balance. Yo, I'm tired of struggling. I feel like I am the undiscovered supermodel. You know what I'm saying? And again, I would probably want to call my family too, but Jade seems to have absolutely no sympathy for Wendy, which is kind of insane. And like the other girls recognize it as insane. And so they start to laugh at the situation. <laughs> I'm tired of this. <laughs> I'm in the corner laughing, Fernanda's is laughing, which is just like adding fuel to the fire. And of course their laughter only angers Jade more, which leads to her saying this immortal line. This is a competition. This is not America's next top best friend. If that quote sounds familiar to any fans of RuPaul's Drag Race, just know that this came out in 2006 and Drag Race did not premiere until 2009. Honestly, I could probably do a whole episode on how much Drag Race was inspired by Top Model, but, but I, I can barely do these normal episodes that I'm trying to do, so, so I probably won't. In any case, I think it's safe to say that that Jade did not handle the situation well. No, I'm a threat. I'm a strong ass woman. I'm a soldier's sister. Recognize. And you're wearing a crown on your head. You don't look ridiculous. You out here in your pants. Okay. I'm, I'm looking. Of too. course, I'm in my panties, and I look damn good. Broke ass crown. They ain't even real diamonds. But at the same time, she handled it perfectly. You need to not take your attitude out on other people. Goodbye, Jade. Goodbye, Jade. Love. Love. And again. She has just survived Katrina. I, I cannot stress that enough. These girls are horrible, Mom. They are trying to corrupt me, Mom. For the photo shoot, the girls pose for a mock magazine cover and they do it on a set full of ice for reasons that I'm, I'm still not entirely clear on. Today's shoot is on this amazing set made of ice and you'll each be shot as if it's a magazine cover. I think that maybe they were hoping that one of the girls would end up in the early stages of hypothermia for the drama. I had a lot of fun last week doing my best to approximate the photo shoot myself, but the only way I could think to do that this week would be to like get in my underwear and pose by my open freezer. So that's what I did. I am apologizing to everyone who who just saw my nipples. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Fun fact, if I were a woman, that would be considered pornography for some reason. Not a lot happens during the photo shoot. Uh, my favorite part is that when Wendy comes on set, Jay has like the most ham-fisted way of making sure everyone remembers her story that the show has done yet. I know you're from New Orleans where it's typically a little warmer. <laughs> like they really cannot let her pass a scene without making sure we know, we know who she is and why she's there. Other than that though, nothing much happens. So we can just skip ahead to judging. 
where also not a lot happens, this is kind of a front-loaded episode. Like I already said, Tyra starts judging by announcing the theme of the week. This week you learned about how to pose for a cover of a magazine. Which, which again, just so specific. The lessons aren't usually that specific. I really, I really don't know what I'm gonna do with that. As for the actual judging, it feels to have gotten a little bit harsher this week. Uh, like last week I said that they were kind of trying to chip away at Brooke's confidence, but um, this week they seem to have gone at it with a jackhammer. You're not sort of classically pretty. What you are is sort of wrong. Jesus. But that wrong is so right. Because you're not conventionally pretty, that could be your fortune. It's very fun too because the judges, I think, think that they were giving her a bunch of compliments, but but they, they weren't. They really weren't. When Wendy comes out, they tell her that her hairstyle doesn't work for her, which is a weird sort of mind game because they are the ones who made her get that hairstyle, like, two days earlier. With your hair, you've got a lot of volume to it, making your shoulders look not as wide even now. Tyra decides that they should slick it back and in doing so, we learn that Tyra has a little hairstylist man that she's able to summon at all times because she is, of course, all powerful. I want you slicked back in a tight bun. Are we having a flash dance moment? I feel like she should rip her shirt so down, <laughs> exactly. I agree with you. I think you look stunning now. I guess it does look a lot better, but like it also looks a lot more like her original hairstyle, and it's just like, come on, show. This girl is going through enough right now. She does not need any more mind games. Joni, meanwhile, has another awesome photo, which means that this is the week that they decide to introduce her storyline, which, as I mentioned in the first video, seems to be that she has a snaggle tooth. And as you can imagine, they handle that very delicately. Joni. Joni might be pretty with her mouth shut. As soon as she opens her mouth, I'm sorry, but that tooth? <laughs> That's a problem. 1-800-SMILE and that can be done, child. <laughs> that is a very rude thing to say behind someone's back. Although somehow still nicer than the things that they say to Brooke's face. When it's Jade's turn to come out, Twiggy is still very much afraid of her. You scare me a little bit when you come out because you're, you're very aggressive. And she's probably right to be because Jade is still very pissed off about her fight with Wendy and her take on the situation is a little different from, from everyone else involved. Jade, are you angry? That's weird. I'm having a little difficult time in the house with some of the girls. I'm, I'm getting a little bit of um, problems with some of the girls. What is going on? I know that I'm a big threat, I feel, in the house because I, I have the most dramatic transformation, I feel. It's such a transition. I know this probably shouldn't be my takeaway, but all I can think watching that is, man, do I wish I had Jade's confidence. It'd be so much happier. Jade's inability to leave the drama out of the judging panel lands her in the bottom two, though, and she, of course, is joined by Wendy, who, as I already said, is the one who goes home this week. Well, Jade and Wendy, please step forward. And basically, the rest of this video is going to be me talking about Wendy because the show did not handle her situation well. Like, like between between Top Model and George Bush, it's it's honestly hard to say who did a worse job at handling Katrina. I feel like the show might argue that they were kind of like shining light on the situation by having her on as a contestant, but if that's the case, then it really feels more exploitative than helpful. Wendy is so clearly not in a good headspace. I mean, like, look at her picture from last week. What I actually enjoy about your photograph is the fact that the sadness that seems to be in your eyes is in fact an emotion. I still, for the life of me, am not entirely sure what Nigel was trying to say with that assemblage of words, but if I had to guess, it would be that looking at that picture, you can see that Wendy is genuinely sad, and it's like, yeah, it is very clear that Wendy is sad. Anyone who talks to her or looks at her could tell that, that Wendy is sad. Mr. J, at one point in this episode, gets mad at Wendy, because she looks like less of a model because it is so clear that she is sad. Remember my comment last photo shoot? It got a little vacant in the face. If you're not thinking it and you're not feeling it, you're not being fierce, it's not gonna look like that in the picture. All right, you're on an adventure. You're walking through. A little more feeling. She's looking a little like a frightened bird. 
I just need something a little stronger, a little more dynamic. I'm concerned about Wendy. I feel like Wendy's state of mind reads on her face. When Wendy walks onto my set, I see the weight of the world on her shoulders. It's never not appropriate to say that Top Model feels like a fever dream, but for Wendy, that really must have been the case because going from being evacuated from your home to this? This is not America's next top best friend. In such a short period of time is more than the human body can handle, I'm sure. I said last week that I wasn't immediately sure why Kathy went home, but that is not the case with Wendy. It is immediately apparent to anyone watching that Wendy was eliminated from the competition because she was never really there to begin with. In joining the competition, she bit off way more than she could chew, and that meant that she was never going to be able to properly compete. And I really hope that doesn't sound like I'm blaming her because that is absolutely not my intention. I completely understand why she was on the show, and it might even be the case that the show provided her with a nice distraction from the stuff that she was dealing with, but Wendy was never going to win. The human body is only capable of a certain amount of bandwidth, and Wendy very understandably was using hers on something else other than worrying about impressing Rachel Zoe. I think what probably happened was that Wendy was given the opportunity of a lifetime, and so she took it despite the fact that she had much bigger things to deal with, because I think that we're all kind of programmed to think that being able to do it all is a virtue when in reality it's really more of a superpower. And just like other superpowers, I'm not entirely convinced that it exists outside of fiction. Some people have a greater capacity for what they can handle, and some people are able to organize how they go about things better, but ultimately everyone has their limit. And despite the fact that I feel like everyone can agree with that statement in concept, in practice, it can actually be really hard to know when you've reached your own. And I don't think it's just a pride thing either. Like, not every limit looks like a limit because they're not all as clear cut as Wendy's was. I personally have self-diagnosed myself with multiple mental illnesses trying to explain why I am the way that I am, many of which I invented myself. But really, the only diagnosis I ever got written down on a medically recognized piece of paper is ADHD. And even though I'm on a constant search to explain why my mental health is what commenters describe as concerning and I'm here if you need help, I never in a million years would have thought to connect my one true blue diagnosis to a lot of my problems. I always think of my ADHD as the reason that I don't read a lot and why I can't make it through a bottle of beer without slowly tearing off the label of the bottle and then usually rolling up the shreds of the label into like little pointies that I turn into little claws and then I usually take those claws and poke whoever I'm with until they get annoyed at me but I never thought that it would be the reason why I would be sad or anything. It honestly wasn't until this past year that I even suspected that ADHD could have any sort of effect on my mood. As you guys can probably tell from looking at me I am very unemployed at the moment, and because of that and some other things that I'm sure you are aware of if you've read the news, I had a lot of free time and not a lot to do over the course of this past year. Like the naive little idiot that I am, I thought that I could make the most of this situation by trying to get my life on track. Like, I was going to make some stuff, and I was going to pick up some new hobbies, and I was going to get into shape, and I was going to do it all before the world got back to normal so that I could come out of quarantine better than ever. Like I said, I'm an idiot. One of the many things on this stupidly ambitious list was that I was going to work on my overall mood, because again, idiot. And one of the ways that I thought I could go about this was, was going off of my doctor prescribed meth that I took for, for my ADHD. For the sake of transparency, I take Vyvanse, but I'm going to call it Adderall going forward because I feel like that's like the generic thing to call it. So anyway, I decided to go off my Adderall and the reason I went off is because I thought that it actually could have been making me anxious because honestly, it does sometimes make me anxious. It doesn't make me that much more anxious than I naturally am, but it definitely turns up the volume a little bit, and I thought that going off might help me chill out a little bit, which was something I thought would be good for me. So then, there I was, off of my Adderall, and day after day I'd wake up with some new thing that I wanted to do, or goal I wanted to accomplish, and then night after night I'd go to bed having done exactly jack shit. 
No matter what my intentions were for the day, I'd be too distracted by the thoughts swirling around in my brain about all the garbage going on around me, which, like, I'm sure I don't have to go into it because I assume everyone watching this also lived through the past year. I did my best to stay positive and tell myself that I'd get them tomorrow, but then tomorrow would come and it'd be even harder to do anything because all the thoughts of all the things that I didn't do were just kind of like heaped on to the giant flaming dumpster fire that was already burning in my brain. After a certain point, I started to think that maybe I had been a little bit too ambitious, so I decided to tighten my focus a little bit, and that coincided with the time that I got the idea for this dumbass series, so I was like, okay, I'll just focus on that. I figured that if I could get one damn video out, then maybe that would mean I would have something to show for this absolute ass of a year. So I put all my energy into trying to do that and, well, I still didn't do jack shit. I try to focus on writing, but the dumpster fire still burned bright inside of my oddly big head. And even when I did manage to think about a script, like I think about it too much. I think about what if it's bad and nobody likes it and everyone hates me or what if it's good and a lot of people like it and then I'm in over my head. I think about how stupid the idea of these videos were to begin with and wonder if I even wanted to make them and, and then I think about the fact that I can't even manage to make one of these videos that I think are stupid and, and I'd wonder what that says about me. And then I think about aliens because like they basically announced that aliens exist last year and nobody is talking about it. Why is nobody talking about it? And after way too much time of not being able to write a single page of this stupid series, I decided maybe it was time I go back on my Adderall, and I did, and it helped, and that's the reason why this sentence I'm saying exists right now. And when I went back on, I was actually surprised to learn that they also improved my mood in a way that I really did not expect because normally when I think of Adderall, I think of it as making me feel like I just butt chugged a gallon of espresso. When I was off, I kind of felt like my brain was like, like a deli. And for the longest time, there were just a bunch of screaming customers all asking to be served all at the same time. And, and I was doing my best to serve everyone, but like, I just couldn't. But then I went back on my pills is, and it was like someone installed one of those things in my brain, you know, where like everyone takes a little paper number and stands in line and then I can deal with them one by one. Like, I still had all the same stuff in my brain, but for the very first time in a long while, it at the very least felt like my brain was manageable. And before I go on, I do want to make it very clear that nothing I'm saying is intended to be taken as mental health advice, and, and any decisions you make should be done with a mental health professional. I am merely recounting my own personal stories, and the only good advice I have to give is about pork products. I also want to make it very clear that being on my ADD meth pills again did not fix everything for me because don't worry, I am still a very broken person with lots and lots of problems. Really the only thing that they did for me was let me focus on one thing a little bit better, but that small change has honestly made all the difference in the world. Drowning out the other thoughts and focusing on just one single thing can honestly feel so counterintuitive sometimes and like even though I just spent an unnecessarily long time talking about how it's made me feel better, it still makes me really uncomfortable. I feel like I'm hardwired to be wary of it when things get too specific and I don't think I'm the only one. I mean, just think about how easy it was to make Feranda handing out those little rules seem like a threatening act. Uh, these are tips. Feranda says for security. Welcome. Welcome. That's hilarious. <laughs> I got a copy for you. You don't have to Here give her yours. Feranda, you're a diva. Was it obnoxious? Maybe. But ultimately, all she was doing is saying, these are my limits. And the only reason why that would feel as aggressive as it does is because we can't look at something as simple as an item on a list and not think like, well, there's got to be more to that, right? I say this a lot for a comedic reality TV reaction YouTube series, but the world is complex. And that complexity means that no matter how much we manage to focus our thoughts, we all know deep down that there's always something else to think about. Focusing on just one thing can sometimes make you feel like you're willfully ignoring everything else, and so it can be tempting to try and tackle all the complexities of your life all at once, but the sad truth of the matter is that no matter how much you want to do, you can only ever handle so much. When you push yourself past your limit, 
basically all you're doing is turning your thoughts into a bunch of models doing their best to call home. They can yell and scream and, and get angry and lash out. This is not America's next top best friend. But ultimately all that comes from that is chaos because at the end of the day, you only really have one phone. For what it's worth, even though the show painted Feranda handing out that list as the ultimate diva act, after the Jay and Wendy fight, we do get a glimpse of the models ultimately saying that the rules were probably a good idea. First I thought Feranda's little rules were stupid, but we just stick to them. This is what I was trying to avoid. And honestly, the more I think about it, the more I think that Feranda was onto something with that list, because really, a simple list is often the best way to deal with stuff. Like, it may seem obvious, but the fact of the matter is that one specific item after another is so much more manageable than a million all at once. I guess what I'm saying is that everyone should be their own true Miss Diva sometimes. I hate that I just said that. Unfortunately, Wendy didn't have the luxury of being able to focus on just one thing at a time, and so she was sent home, but... It's honestly kind of a bummer because if she was able to do what she did on the show when she had that much on her plate, who knows what she could have accomplished if she had the opportunity to give her entire focus to the competition. Like, even if the show only seemed to care about her for her story, I still think she probably could have gone really far. And maybe I didn't learn anything from the show's very specific lesson this week. But that doesn't mean that I think it's not worthwhile because at the end of the day, all the great complexities of life are really just a bunch of specifics piled on top of one another. And you gotta start tackling those specifics if you ever wanna cross any of the big stuff off your list. Oh, and before I go, I do want to make it very clear that I do not think that me having ADHD is the same as Wendy surviving Katrina. I was just being, I was just using that as a jumping off point. Please don't think that I think that those are in any way the same because I know that they're not and I, 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 don't, I don't want you thinking.